Hello, everybody. Welcome. Sure. Thank you for coming out to our first event of the semester. I'm Ben Powell, the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. The Free Market Institute was founded in 2013 to promote the study of uh, freedom and free enterprise and the institutions that support it. And part of that uh, mission of the Institute is to support a public lecture series on campus uh, like we're doing today. And before I introduce our speakers and, and topic for today, uh, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't mention the other ones we have coming up this semester. So mark your calendars for Thursday, March 3rd. We'll be having Randy Holcomb of Florida State University here to talk about the rise of what he calls political capitalism, or what I might call not capitalism and cronyism with the big government. Uh, and then our keynote at the end of the semester is going to be Jason Riley of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Jason Riley uh, wrote an excellent new book, a biography of Thomas Sowell. Uh, who's one of the most important public intellectuals, I think, of the last 50 years. And he's going to be talking about Tom Sowell's ideas, and in particular about race, inequality, and the role of public intellectuals in deb debates. And that's going to be Monday, April 25th. Uh, the Randy Holcomb event will be right in here. This one will be over in the McKenzie Merkin Center. So for today's event, though, I'm very pleased that we have an event going on on money and the rule of law with Peter Becky and Alex Salter. Uh, inflation numbers, if you haven't noticed, have been going up, actually at a 40-year high in the most recent ones that I've seen reported. And they're going to give a talk about the institutions that govern monetary policy with a look particularly towards the Great Recession, but I'm sure they're going to tell us lessons about how it relates to the pandemic and the monetary mischief that's been going on during that. So allow me to briefly introduce them both. Peter Becky is a university professor of economics and philosophy at George Mason University, as well as the director of the F.A. High Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, and the bb and professor for the study of capitalism at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He's also a member of the board of directors of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech, and is a, vis a distinguished visiting scholar with us this semester and spending a significant amount of time here. Uh, he's the author of 17 books and hundreds of journal articles, uh, also uh, in some ways a, a grandfather of the Institute here as he was the chair of not only my own dissertation but Adam Martin and um, he was on Alex Salter's dissertation committee as well. Um, Alex Salter, of course, is one of our own faculty members. He's the Georgie G. Snyder Associate Professor of Economics here in the Rawls College of Business and a Comparative Economics Research Fellow with the Free Market Institute. He's also a senior fellow for the American Institute for Economic Research's Sound Money Project. He's the author of more than 70 research articles. And if you're a reader of the Wall Street Journal, you might have noticed that he's also a frequent contributor to their editorial page, especially over the last 12 months or so. Uh, Pete and Alex are also both co-authors, along with Middle Tennessee State University's Dan Smith, of the book that is the topic for tonight, Money and the Rule of Law, Generality and Predictability in Monetary Institutions. I'm going to turn it over to Pete to start the talk, and then Alex will finish it off from there. Please join me in welcoming them. OK, I'm just going to give a few uh, introductory remarks. Uh, and then Alex will walk you through more details of, of these uh, things. Uh, as Ben mentioned, this is a co-authored uh, project with Alex and with Dan Smith. And it culminates from a lot of papers that we wrote over about uh, you know, six, seven years or whatever uh, that's going on. So the first thing that I want to stress is why money. Uh, money has a purpose. Uh, it is to facilitate exchange. Uh, therefore, it's one half of all exchanges. In a modern economy, money trades for goods and goods trade for money. We don't trade goods for goods. Um, and so everything passes through money. And since it's one half of all exchanges, if you screw around with money, you're going to screw around with the exchange ratios in the economy. And that's going to end up by distorting the pattern of exchange production and distribution in your society. So we have to actually really worry about what we do with this unit called money. In a free society where we've taken care of money, money just sort of is in the background. The sound monetary policy would mean that we would actually not worry so much about fluctuations in the monetary system because they'd be automatically sort of taken care of. At least that's the theory that we have um, on these things. But for a variety of reasons, we don't get that. And so part of the inquiry here is starting to question where does this monetary mischief come from? Now, the reality about monetary mischief is that this has been a concern of economists 
going all the way back to Adam Smith. Adam Smith's book's titled An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. And in the fifth book of that, uh, of that, of, of the Wealth of Nations, Smith has advice that he gives to policymakers. He's trying to explain, like, what are the implications of all my theories for the way that you should do public policy? And what he argues in there is that, um, listen, there's a, a trick that governments engage in, ancient as well as modern. And he calls it a juggling trick. And the juggling trick is as follows. They run deficits, that accumulates into public debt, and then they debase their currency to pay off their debt. And he argues that this juggling trick has in fact been the nation killer. It's the reason why the Roman Empire fell, it's the reason why you have all these things, you know. And so what we have to worry about as economists is in fact making sure that the juggler's hands are tied. Because if they engage in the juggling trick, what they're going to do is activities, as Smith says, that are not only harmful to the economy, but they actually are dishonorable to the government, therefore losing the trust of the relationship between the government and the citizenry. And so what Smith argues is that we should bind the hands of the authority. And that argument held for a very, very long time. All right? And then in the 20th century, we more or less, economics became not about binding the hands of the rulers, but instead trying to be master jugglers. What we're going to now do is use the tools of economic reasoning to try to help economists, as they're being trained, to learn how to become master jugglers. This is a funny term, master, right? My, I was just telling Ben, my, my son is interviewing for jobs right now, and he... Uh, might join a clinic, starting, he's a, a doctor in PT, he might join a clinic, and what the boss of the clinic told him is that if you stay with us for four years, you'll become a master PT. He says, you know, like, just like, a, and then he said, just like a master plumber, uh, right? He said, you, you're four years, you're with us, and so you do that. And economists, they go to graduate school, and they learn how to become master central bankers, which are these master jugglers, You're supposed to, you know, do all of that. But the question that economists have asked, and which Alex will go over in the, in, and when we look at the data, is how well do we do as master jugglers? And not only that, what is the consequence of in our juggling if we actually drop you know, the balls? Right? What happens with this? So Milton Friedman in Capitalism and Freedom actually makes an argument that any institution in which a sincere error by a few, notice it's not a cynical error, a sincere error by a few is perhaps an institution that we can't afford because the consequences of that error are so great. So we have to worry about monetary mischief and we're trying to figure out how to embed it in a broader system. And in doing this, we're drawing on the work of Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, and James Buchanan, three Nobel Prize winners, all of whom throughout their career were concerned with this issue about how it is that you tie the hands of the rulers so that you can have generality and predictability in your economic life. Because without that generality and predictability, you're going to end up by distorting the incentives that individuals face in their pattern of exchange, production, and distribution. To put it very bluntly, the wealth and poverty of nations determines on how well you control these institutions. Right? You need to have security of property rights, you need to have sound money, you need to have fiscal responsibility. If you don't have those things, you're not going to be able to have the kind of levels of economic growth and generalized prosperity, which makes for a thriving economy. And so what our book is about is an introduction to this debate about these issues in the context of our modern uh, idea. And so sound money is so central to a thriving economy that we believe that economists have to get this discourse right. And if we don't get it right, we're going to be in deep trouble. As Ben just mentioned, right now, uh, we are experiencing inflation. You have Professor Greer here. Professor Greer and I are relative contemporaries. We actually lived through the 70s, and, and, and we can remember and talk to you. Some of the people here can do that as well. The students here, you have no idea. You haven't dealt with high bouts of inflation and, and or stagflation or anything like that. But we are actually experiencing those uh, you know, right now, and how do we address those? So I will just end, before I turn it over to Alex, with a mention of two recent teaching tools. One of them is a podcast that I really like. 
It's called Econ Talk. Uh, you just look it up on the web, Econ Talk. And Russ Roberts does it. And just this week on Monday, he uh, did a podcast with John Taylor. And he's revisiting a lot of the issues that Alex will go over with you and everything about what the issue is with the current monetary policy. John Taylor is, is a very important macroeconomist um, and an expert in monetary policy. And the other one is an article that was published just last Sunday by Raghu Rajan. <clears throat> Raghu Rajan is a professor at uh, Chicago, but he was also the head of the Central Bank of India. And the title of his article is The End of uh, Free Lunch Economics. Free lunch public policy, basically. And his argument is that what we've been doing since, say, the global financial crisis is engaging in a lot of free lunch monetary policy. And now the bill is coming home to pay. And that's what's going on. And so, Alex, come on up and, and, and walk through the, the, the arguments in the book. But this is what we're trying to do in the book, is introduce this conversation from Buchanan and Hayek and Friedman, and then update it for the debates that are taking place today. So anyway, thank you very much, and I greatly appreciate your comments. Yep. Thank you, Pete. That was a great way of framing the project. I'm happy to talk to you tonight in a little more detail about the arguments that I and my co-authors make in the book Money and the Rule of Law. And so, as Pete said, this is something that's particularly relevant right now, since we're experiencing, at the moment, the highest inflation that the United States has experienced in almost 40 years. When you think of things that you usually have beaten, when you usually think of things that we kind of understand how it works, inflation is usually up there among them. If you read any principles of economics textbook, they'll tell you we have a pretty good understanding of where inflation comes from. It comes from too much purchasing power, chasing too few goods. We thought we had a handle on it, and yet here we are. Everything that is old is new again, and so it seems like that uh, now is a really good time for us to reconsider the foundations of the institutions that create and uh, that create the supply of money and figure out how that's actually used in terms of money, credit, and the financial system. Can anyone tell me who this gentleman is? <laughs> Not Milton Friedman. I'm sorry. Uh, ben Bernanke. Ben Bernanke. This is Ben Bernanke. He was chairman of the Federal Reserve during the financial crisis of 2008. The financial crisis of 2008 is really our lodestar for this book. It's the key event in macroeconomic slash financial history that we use to motivate our argument. In a way, the timing of this book coming to press was a little bit inauspicious since as we were finished writing the book and submitted it and we're getting ready to publish it, uh, COVID happened. And so all the turmoil in financial markets and all the extraordinary monetary policy that the Federal Reserve promulgated then, that sort of took center stage. So we got scooped by another crisis. But that's okay because a lot of the lessons that we talk about in the context of how our central bank responded to 2008 also apply to what happened in 2020, 2021, up through today, really. So here's the context. Ben Bernanke in the early 2000s was giving a speech at a conference honoring Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, two giants of monetary economics from the 20th century. Ben Bernanke was then on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. He wasn't yet running the show, though. He wasn't yet chairman. So at the end of this conference, Bernanke turns to Milton and Anna, who are both in attendance, and says, uh, in response to your pioneering work in monetary economics, I wanted to let you know, yeah, we, the Federal Reserve, put the Great in Great Depression. Looking back in the 1930s, part of the reason the Great Depression was so great, Friedman and Schwartz convinced the profession, was because the Federal Reserve mismanaged the money supply. They dropped the ball. But thank you, Milton. Thank you, Anna, said Professor Bernanke. Thanks to you, we know better now, and we're not going to do it again. It seems pretty extraordinary to say, we're not going to drop the ball like this again. But at the time, there was actually a lot of credibility behind that. We were towards the end, but still ongoing, in the middle of what economists called the Great Moderation, basically a 20-plus year period of strong economic growth. Recessions, when they happened, were few and far between. It seemed like we had reached the end of history with respect to macroeconomic policy. So although this seems like an extraordinary statement, 
at the time, it seemed justified, right? We don't have to worry about financial crises. We don't have to worry about uh, monetary-induced recessions. We've got all that figured it out. We've, we're so confident. We've put it in all our principles books. We're good to go. Thank you, Milton. Thank you, Anna. We figured it out because of you. Now we can tackle all these difficult problems. Alas, it was too soon to take a victory lap. It was too soon to claim that central banking had fixed permanently what was going on with money mischief. As we saw in 2008, central banks very much are capable of dropping the ball. Part of the reason that the recovery from the financial crisis was so slow, part of the reason we had a financial crisis in the first place, was due to the monetary policy of the Federal Reserve. Was it the only thing going on? No. Was it a major driver? Yes. So it seems that we cannot yet celebrate and rest on our laurels. We have to look back and figure out what went wrong and what we, reflecting on that unfortunate instance of policy making, can do about it. Okay. Here's how the Fed messed up. They messed up beforehand, before the bubble burst in 2008. They messed up afterwards. We got it coming and going, in other words. Here's what started it all. This is a graph. Whoops. Just kidding. There we go. This is a graph of what's called the federal funds rate. The federal funds rate in 2008, up until pretty recently actually, was the key policy interest rate of the Federal Reserve. Now, you've probably read articles in the financial press that go something like, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, or the Federal Reserve cut interest rates. That's a kind of shorthand that oftentimes conceals more than it reveals. The federal funds rate is a market rate of interest. The Federal Reserve cannot make it whatever it wants all the time. It's the rate that banks, private banks, charge each other for extremely short-term loans. The main way the Federal Reserve used to influence liquidity in the banking system, in the financial system, was buying or selling assets. And in the short run, if the Federal Reserve purchased assets, expanded its balance sheet, basically printed up new money and injected it into the banking system, in the short run, due to what economists call the liquidity effect, interest rates would come down. They would eventually go back up, Right? But in the short run, you should see a negative relationship between the size of the balance sheet and short-term interest rates. What this graph is showing you is the actual federal funds rate, that's that thick black line, and the level of the federal funds rate that is consistent with a given level of inflation, according to what's called the Taylor Rule. Uh, Pete just talked a couple of minutes ago about John Taylor. It's that same Taylor who came up with the Taylor Rule. It's widely regarded as one of the most important principles in monetary economics. What this graph is showing you is that the Federal Reserve injected a lot of liquidity into the financial system between 2002 and 2006, thereabouts, such that even if the central bank were trying to generate as much as 4% inflation, the interest rate that we actually got was even lower than that because of the excess liquidity put in the financial system. Again, central banks cannot make interest rates whatever they want. They are determined in markets which are frequently global. But in the short run, in the short run, there can be deviations in the market rate of interest from the rate of interest that reflects economic fundamentals. And that's what we contend is going on here. Part of the reason that we had a liquidity boom, that we had a credit boom, rather, was due to this artificially cheap liquidity. In other words, the Federal Reserve helped contribute to the conditions that inflated the financial bubble in the first place. That's what happened before the 2008 crisis. That sort of set the stage for it. After the crisis, if they were too loose beforehand, during and after they made precisely the opposite mistake. I'm showing you now a graph of what economists call aggregate demand, basically total purchasing power in the economy. In the short run, the level of aggregate demand, or its growth rate, growth rate you can talk in terms of either, the level of aggregate demand does have a significant effect on economic performance. In the long run, it doesn't, right? In the long run, it doesn't matter with the flow of money throughout the economy. It doesn't matter how many green pieces of paper we have in our wallets. The wealth and poverty of nations in the long run is determined by human capital, physical capital, institutions like property rights, uh, natural resource availability. These things determine living standards in the long run. In the short run, though, economic coordination, the ordinary operation of the marketplace, can sometimes get messed up by large and unexpected swings and aggregate demand. What this graph is showing us is that the black line, which is actual aggregate demand, and the dotted line are growing basically about a pace right up until 2008 when the black line drops sharply, sharply below potential. 
That's the central bank's fault. Part of the reason that the recession following the actual bursting of the asset bubble was so severe is that the Fed mismanaged aggregate demand. Nominal spending, right, total spending in the economy is ultimately the Federal Reserve's responsibility. Again, they cannot make it whatever they want, just like they can't make interest rates whatever they want. But because the Federal Reserve, as the central bank, has a monopoly on the creation of what we call high-powered money, new bank deposits, liquidity, it's up to them ultimately to make sure that the money supply isn't bottoming out. In this case, it seems bizarre to say that the Fed didn't do enough in response to the bubble bursting. Because from 2008, uh, 2007 rather, to I think late 2008, their balance sheet more than doubled. Before the financial crisis, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, total assets that they held, was just under a trillion dollars. Right, by 2012, it was nearly three trillion trillion dollars, if I'm remembering correctly, and they continued to buy assets more and more up until about 2016, when it was over four trillion dollars. That's a lot of asset purchases. That's a lot of support that the central bank is giving the economy. If we're talking about a four-fold, a factor of four increase in the Fed's balance sheet, how can we possibly say that the Federal Reserve dropped the ball and didn't do enough? The answer is. They didn't just create the new liquidity. They did something specific with it. Yes, they printed up new money. Yes, they used that new money to take bad assets, namely the infamous mortgage-backed securities and some other stuff, off private banks' balance sheets that should have contributed to a large increase in systemic liquidity. But it didn't because the central bank also, in 2008, started experimenting with a new policy. It started paying banks interest on reserves. Imagine this. Imagine the central bank prints up, I don't know, five trillion new dollars and hands it to me. Lucky me. For whatever reason, I turn around and bury that five trillion dollars in my backyard. What's going to be the overall effect on economic activity? Nothing, right? The money has to circulate in order for it to have an effect. All this new money that the Fed created did not circulate. The reason is they paid banks interest not to lend it out. They created a bunch of new liquidity, gave it to banks, and then, in effect, borrowed it back by paying banks interest to keep that new liquidity parked in the vaults. At the time, it seemed like there was a good reason to do this. The Fed wanted to shore up banks' balance sheets without creating inflation. Obviously, inflation is something that we want to avoid. We're sort of experiencing that right now. Unfortunately, what they did by paying interest on reserves was completely sterilize all that new liquidity. And so the only possible institution that could create new liquidity to support the financial system, the Federal Reserve, sterilized its own policy, which is why we got this big drop. Right? And notice that we never got back to the trend line. We're just growing at the same rate again. All that gap between the dotted line and the solid line represents foregone wealth, foregone economic activity. Because the Federal Reserve thought it was undertaking a smart policy by creating new liquidity and then paying banks not to do anything with it, in reality, they were just sitting around while Rome was burning. So again, too loose beforehand, too tight during after. So we made the full spectrum of mistakes, right? We went from too loose to too tight, and we never really got the Goldilocks spot. We never got it just right. Why do we suck so bad at central banking? <laughs> Seriously. The Federal Reserve has been around since 1913. Technically, it started operations in 1914. The Federal Reserve Act passed in December of 1913. That's more than 100 years of US central banking. You'd think we would understand a thing or two by now. Ben Bernanke certainly thought we did. So why are we so bad at it still? It can't be because our policymakers aren't smart enough. It can't be because they're not well-intentioned enough. It has to be a problem with the rules of the game. I and my co-authors contend that the problem with central banking is that policymakers at the top of central banking have too much discretion in terms of the goals that they want to pursue. When you allow policymakers in the position of being in control of systemically important institutions too much discretion, that necessarily means there are going to be multiple opportunities for the mistakes made by a small number of people to reverberate throughout the entire financial system. Remember the Milton Friedman quote that Pete told us just a couple of minutes ago, any system in which a small number of people making honest mistakes can basically ruin an entire economy is a bad system. We allow policymakers too much discretion because we mistakenly think that we need them to fine-tune the economy, 
like they're messing with an engine or playing chess or something. That's not what an economy is like. An economy is something much more delicate. It's much closer to an ecosystem than a machine. And so the right way to think about the role of policymakers or policymaking institutions like the Fed is to create the background conditions that give economic activity a stable foundation. And we contend that the best way to do that is to replace discretionary monetary policy with rule-bound monetary policy. The central bank needs to be handed a rule that dictates the goal or objective of policy, and this is important, the central bank cannot determine that rule for itself. It has to be imposed, not voluntarily adopted. If it's voluntarily adopted, it can be voluntarily relinquished. And any rule that you get to choose whether or not you follow it is not actually a rule. It's at most a guideline. We need true rules for monetary policy. That's how we make this thing work as well as it possibly can. It's not going to be perfect. Perfect isn't an option. But in terms of good enough for government work, as they say, we need rules. How can it be that rules outperform discretion? Every recession is partly unique, right? There's always something that's special. There's always the exigencies of the moment. How can it be that without uh, thinking about what's particular and complicated and unique to each case, we can just impose a rule on the system and actually have it outperform the best judgment of policymakers? There are true two, excuse me, broad reasons that we say discretionary central banking fails. The first is due to what we call the knowledge problem. The second is due to what we call the incentive problem. And I'm going to talk to you about each in turn. This is an argument for why rules work better than discretion. Let's start with the knowledge problem. We uh, talk about two different kinds of problems that pertain to knowledge in this chapter. First, we start with what are called technical problems. In other words, informational burdens. I want to specify up front, these problems, although they're really hard to solve, can in principle be solved. Right? So in the, real, in the real world, these are never going to fully be solved, but at least conceptually, you can have quote unquote solutions to them in the sense that they're not like automatic defeaters for discretionary central banking. Nonetheless, they do pose significant challenges to policymakers. It may surprise you to learn that in the monetary economics literature, to this day, there is no unanimous agreement amongst monetary policy scholars over what the objectives are of monetary policy, what we're basically trying to do, what our targets are, what variables are we trying to hit or control with policy, or the instruments. What do we use to get there? Right? There's a massive debate in the monetary economics literature to this day about whether the Fed funds rate is in fact an instrument. Right? The interest rate that we always talk about, the Fed raised interest rates, the Fed cut interest rates, even that thing that we take for granted, if you actually talk to the central bankers and ask them, is that your instrument? They'll go, it's complicated. Get a PhD and come back to me. It doesn't get any less complicated, by the way. It's still complicated. That's the point. That's the point. If we can't actually get sufficient agreement on these foundational questions amongst the experts in the field, why do we think that their discretion can outperform rules? There's not really any strong reason for thinking they can. But ultimately, that's not the big fish. What we really care about are true knowledge problems. Right? And to understand the knowledge problem, the thinker whose work we build on is a gentleman named F.A. Hayek, or Friedrich Hayek, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1974, six? 74, 1974. Hayek is most remembered for his contributions to the economics of knowledge. Right? His argument for how the price system makes each of us cooperating with each other economically smarter than we could possibly be even if you added up all of our disparate knowledge or intelligences, right? How does an economic system coordinate itself? 333 million Americans, we each specialize in something different, we each got our own thing going on, right? None of us produces any one good start to finish. Even the simplest goods, shirts, pencils, a ham sandwich, even all those super simple goods take hundreds of steps Right, cooperating with millions of people all across the globe to put together that sandwich, that pencil, that shirt, and get it into your hands. Nobody knows how to make a pencil or a sandwich or a shirt start to finish. So how do we get them? The market system, coordinated by supply and demand and market prices, helps us cope with our own ignorance. We don't need to know everything. We just need to be good at a little bit of our part, cooperate with everybody else by trading, 
and the market system itself, the private property system operating according to profit and loss, gives us the feedback. Right? It generates the information that tells us whether we're doing a good job or not. Think about this in the context of business. Profit and loss is a crucial piece of feedback information that tells businesses whether they're producing something that customers want and sells it to them at prices that they can afford. Businesses need to know what to produce. That's by no means obvious. They need to figure out how to produce it. There are multiple ways to produce any given good or service. How do businesses know they're making the right stuff and producing it in a cost-minimizing way? The market price system generates that information for them in the form of feedback. Profits is us telling businesses we like what you're doing, keep doing it. Losses means we don't like this so much. Either we don't like what you're making or we don't like how you're making it. It's up for businesses to use that information to help guide production plans to satisfy the interests of consumers. Notice that you couldn't do any of that without the market price system. The market is not merely one mechanism for allocating resources efficiently. The market itself is the process whereby we even know what efficiency means or efficiency is. So we solve the knowledge problem, or rather cope with the knowledge problem, through feedback. What feedback do central bankers have examining the economy from on high in the Eccles building in Washington, D.C. for knowing whether monetary policy is appropriately tight or appropriately loose real time? There's no way for them to know that, right? They simply cannot know that. Because money is one half of all exchanges, trying to plan money is indirectly the same kind of planner's problem as trying to plan an entire economy. You can no more engineer monetary equilibrium, right, a well-behaved market for money balances, than you can any other market. That's the key. No feedback, no reliable information. Discretionary central banking is basically trying to steer, quote unquote, the economy like on a windy mountain road while looking in the rearview mirror. And then we act surprised when the whole thing goes over the guardrails. Of course it does. There's no way to keep the vehicle straight and steady because we don't even know what straight and steady means in real time. We don't even know how to fix that problem. The way that you get around the knowledge problem isn't by trying to solve it. The way that you cope with the knowledge problem is by setting a firm foundation for economic activity, by having central bankers follow a clear rule that's obviously communicated to the public so that the public knows the rules of the game. Rather than trying to micromanage, you set up the game board and let people play the game. We should have our central bankers be referees rather than picking winners and losers or pretending that they're players of the game. That's not what they're for. Incentive problems. Economists love talking about incentives, right? Incentives, incentives, incentives. That which gets somebody to act some way as opposed to some other way. If you've taken an economics course, you understand incentives pretty well. The idea here is we pretend that monetary policy is inherently apolitical. We pretend that central bankers are sort of disinterested technocrats who are sort of engineering and tinkering with the thing for the public good. But of course, central banking itself is and always has been political. We document the numerous ways over the history of the Federal Reserve where central banks have succumbed to political pressure. Sometimes that political pressure comes from outside in the form of elected politicians. We'll talk about that in a minute. But a lot of times, that political pressure is generated internally. The central bank is a bureaucracy. Bureaucracies face a very concrete set of incentives. They want to maximize their budget. They want to expand their mandate. They want to accomplish a whole bunch of objectives that aren't necessarily in line with the public interest. That's the key associated with all this, right? Put yourself from the perspective of a, of a central banker. Imagine that you're running a central bank when markets are in turmoil. Financial markets are unsteady, Wall Street's looking to you. What are you going to do as a central banker, right? You could either intervene too little or intervene too much. If you intervene too little, markets are gonna crash and the history books will remember you as the central banker on whose watch Great Depression 2.0 happened. Well, you don't want that, right? Who wants to have nasty stuff written about them in the history books or the popular press for that matter? So you go pedal to the metal. You basically open the floodgates of liquidity to the financial system and do whatever needs to be done to stabilize it. Yeah, that works in the short run. You can quite literally paper over structural problems in the financial sector by printing up money and giving it away. That works. But the cost of that is the permanent reduction in the robustness of the financial system. What incentive or incentives 
do private bankers have to economize on risk if they know that the central bank is always going to bail them out when things get rough? Not much, right? We call that moral hazard in economics. Despite its name, it doesn't actually have anything to do with ethics. Moral hazard in economics refers to any situation where you change your behavior to engage in more risk after you've protected yourself against that risk. Right? Imagine that I take out a new life insurance policy on myself and then say, you know what I've always wanted to try? Skydiving. But I wait until after I take out the life insurance policy to try skydiving. That's moral hazard. In the context of monetary policy, what the central bank has done over the past 20, 30, 40 years has given Wall Street the taxpayer's credit card and said, go to town, right? go to Vegas, gamble. Anything that you make, you keep. If you lose money, though, the taxpayer will cover you. Wouldn't you take that deal? i take that deal. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. So the problem here is that we shouldn't blame the players. The problem is the game itself. And that's among the incentive problems that we really need to get control over. Now, those were things that were internal to the bureaucracy, that are sort of self-generated. There are also problems that come from elected officials. You may remember that back from 2017 to 2018, when the Federal Reserve was considering normalizing monetary policy, there was actually some indication that the Fed might shrink its balance sheet, shocker of shockers. Right? Well, in the short run, monetary tightening can sometimes have an apparently adverse effect on economic performance. Why only apparently? Right? Because when it looks like markets are not doing as well when you cut off the liquidity spigot, that means that markets are engaged in the hard and necessary effort of recalculating and figuring out which lines of production are truly sustainable and which ones aren't. Right? If the Federal Reserve announces a taper and markets hiccup, that's because all of, a, all of a sudden markets think, okay, now we have to actually sort out for ourselves what works and what doesn't, and we can't just rely on cheap and pretty much infinitely available liquidity. That's not going to work anymore. But of course, politicians are on a short-term electoral cycle. They want to get reelected, right? And so when push comes to shove, they never want the central bank to normalize on their watch. They're always for monetary policy normalization, just after the next election, right? Wait until I'm term limited, then you can, then you can take care of monetary policy. The most famous instance of this in the 20th century wasn't with this gentleman, wasn't with President Trump, but actually was with President Nixon browbeating Arthur Burns to run the economy, or well, to run the printing presses to uh, artificially create a small boom in the economy on the eve of the 72 election. Because one of the key determinants of whether politicians get reelected is the economy, particularly how strong it is, or how strong it appears to be, close to the election. We have this idea, of course, now that we have the famous breach of uh, in Federal Reserve independence between President Nixon and then Chairman Burns, that that was like the only time it happened in the 20th century. Uh-uh. Every president does it. Right? Jimmy Carter did it. Reagan did it. Clinton did it. Everybody does it. Right? We only pay attention when it's highly visible, but it always happens. And that's one of the things that we need to stop. Even more worryingly, a gentleman named William Dudley, who was the uh, president of the New York branch of the Federal Reserve, one of the most important branches of the Federal Reserve, even wrote an article suggesting the possibility that the Fed should consciously tank, re, uh, tank the economy on the eve of the election so that this guy would not win. You actually had somebody who was supposed to be like this apolitical, disinterested technocrat, purely working for the public good, say in a major publication, hey, maybe Fed policymakers should purposefully hurt the economy so that the guy that I don't like uh, doesn't win an election. That's a huge deal. That's a major breach of quote unquote political independence. What this really tells us is that control over the central bank is an arms race. And nobody wins an arms race, right? How many of you have seen war games? The only way to win is not to play, right? To get out of the escalating spiral of I'm arming, so you're arming, so I'm arming, so you're arming. We'd all be better off if we could get off this merry-go-round. The way that you get off the merry-go-round is with rules rather than discretion. But what about financial crises, right? What about when we're actually in the middle of a crisis? Surely we can't be, you know, dog, uh, dogmatic rules advocates when we're in the middle of a financial crisis. It's all well and good to talk about this stuff during ordinary times, but in 2008, markets were melting. It looked like the bottom was dropping out of the global financial system. We needed to do something about that. Well, even then, we contend, we would want the central bank to have to follow a rule that itself did not choose. 
That's the key, right? The central bank cannot be a judge in its own cause. If you get the judge, when you're, whether you're following a rule or not, again, it's not really a rule. At most, it's a guideline. And what we talk about here is sort of the, uh, the orthodox playbook for how a central bank should behave during a financial crisis. It might surprise you to learn that the basic playbook for how a central bank should behave during a crisis was written in 1873. Not 1973, 1873, right? So the end of the 19th century. It was written by an economist, a British economist named Walter Badgett, and the rules that he proposed for central bank behavior are so famous, right, they now bear his name, Badgett's rules, that they're widely perceived to be central bank best practice during a financial crisis. What are Badgett's rules? One, the central bank must lend freely. However much liquidity the market wants, the central bank should stand prepared to deliver it. But not without condition, not for free. That's where rules two and three come in. Rule two, the central bank should only loan money to banks or other financial institutions if those institutions have good collateral. Loans have to be backed up with collateral, right? That's what a loan is. What counts as good collateral? Anything whose value, whose price is known in the ordinary course of business. We know that that did not qualify, uh, that that condition didn't qualify for many of the assets that the Fed ended up purchasing, especially the now infamous mortgage-backed securities. How do we know they didn't qualify? Because we actually have the transcripts of the meeting when Ben Bernanke himself, talking about the mortgage-backed securities, said, I have no idea what these things are worth. He actually said, I would like to know what the bleep these things are worth. When a bleep is, of course, a four-letter word, which I'm not going to repeat here. You get the picture, right? They didn't know what that was. They didn't know it was, if it was high value, low value, what its price should be. It's a bad asset. Nobody knows how to value it. It cannot possibly serve as the source of collateral for emergency lending. So rule two, oops, didn't follow that one. Rule three, charge a penalty rate of interest. You can have a loan if you have good collateral. But whatever rate the market is charging, we're gonna charge a little bit more. That gives you, the private bank, an incentive not to overload on risk in the first place. Right, because if the central bank is just giving you the be uh, as good a deal as you could get anywhere else, there's no real cost to engaging in reckless behavior. And of course, banks collectively engaging in reckless behavior is one of the major reasons that we have financial crises in the first place. Right, so the Fed followed rule number one, it did lend freely, Remember, it's balance sheet multiplied by a factor of four. That counts as freely, right? When you go from one trillion to four trillion in a few short years, that's not being tight-fisted with your money. That's being quite liberal and magnanimous with your liquidity. The problem was they broke rules two and three. Two, no penalty rate of interest. In fact, the Fed charged a better than market rate of interest over the course of the financial crisis. And rule three, there was no coll uh, collateral quality restriction in any meaningful sense. The only way Badgett's rules work, by the way, is if they're credibly announced publicly beforehand by the central bank. But for 40 years, the Fed has been breaking these rules. Right? Go back to the Continental Illinois bailout of 94. Right? In 1999, the Federal Reserve bailed out a hedge fund called Long-Term Capital Management. Not even a bank, a hedge fund. That was a major precedent-setting event because it was the first time that an organization that was not a traditional bank got a bailout. It's one thing to bail out banks, right? But if you can bail out a hedge fund, you can bail out anybody, right? There's no principled limitation on who gets free liquidity in that case. So we can't actually have these ad hoc decision procedures by the Fed. We need rules. Well, which rules? It may surprise you to learn that we don't actually pick a specific rule in the book. That's not what the book project is about. The book project is about reminding and convincing economists, as well as citizens at large, that we need some rule. Right? Obviously, some rules are better than others, but it's almost more important that we embrace this rules-based mindset so we can get control over the central banking run amok process. What we do say about rules is they should have two main criteria, which are in the title of the book. The rule should be general, and the rule should be predictable. General means it's beneficial to the public interest. It's not just good for Wall Street, it's not just good for political insiders, right? It's not just good for somebody who can afford to maintain a lobbying office on K Street. It needs to serve the general interest. It needs to be in the interest of all Americans because all Americans have an incentive or have an interest in maintaining financial and economic stability. And the rule needs to be predictable. 
The most important thing about the rule is before the you-know-what hits the fan, we have a reasonable idea of how the rule is going to play out in crisis situations. That predictability helps economic agents coordinate with each other. And again, economic coordination is ultimately at the heart of the market system. Markets are one vast network for communicating and coordinating decisions about how to produce and allocate resources. Think of like a giant wheel with millions of spokes. Money is the hub. It's the center. The economy can work if one or two spokes is broken, or even if many spokes are broken. But if there's a problem at the hub, the whole thing goes belly up. That's why we need predictability in our monetary institutions. We need to pick something and force the Fed to follow it. A strict inflation target, an aggregate demand target. There are many, many possibilities. The important thing is, though, that it's no longer acceptable for the bureaucrats who run the Fed to say, here's what we're going to do today, or here's what we're going to do tomorrow. We need to put this thing on a general and predictable path so that we can keep markets as stable as possible when we need that stability the most. So ultimately what we want to emphasize with this book project is we don't want to think about money any differently than we do any other good or service or market. Money has some unique economic properties but that at the end of the day there is only the economic way of thinking. Right? How purposive individuals respond to incentives and use the information they have at their disposal to interact profitably with their neighbors, with their traders, with their colleagues. Right? When we bring that basic economic way of thinking to money, we realize that as a foundational institution of commercial society, as the bedrock of liberal market economies, we need to think about money in this rule-based and rule-bound sense. Right? We apply the idea of the rule of law to pretty much every other institution in liberal democracies. Right? This basic jurisprudential norm is held to be essential for self-governance in a democratic republic. And most of our public institutions, at least on paper, have to conform to the rule of law. And yet central bankers seem to be this one institution where we say, eh, whatever the guys in charge say, they can do whatever they want. That doesn't seem to square with what makes a liberal democracy a liberal democracy. It's certainly not good for economic stability. So both for reasons of democratic accountability and economic flourishing, we need to get rid of discretionary central banking and find a way to put monetary policy on a rule-bound format. That's our argument. Thank you for your time and consideration.